Um, our advocacy is interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee uh, that brings together leaders from 18 agencies, departments, and offices across the U U.S. federal government to enhance collaboration on research in the Arctic. Um, IARPIC Collaborations is the public branch of IARPIC that aims to facilitate interagency communication, coordination, and collaboration to advance Arctic science. Um, so IARPIC released its Arctic Research Plan 2022 to 2026 and its first biennial implementation plan uh, last year. Uh, so the model of community of practice aims to enhance understanding of the integrated Arctic system uh, through the use of regional and global uh, system models. And uh, we're contributing to several uh, deliverables of the, uh, the, the communities. Um, so to, for today, uh, the topic is, is um, the decadal timescale predictability of the Arctic. Um, so the steady decline of sea ice in the Arctic in recent decades suggests that um, the Arctic Ocean might be virtually ice-free at some point um, during this century. Um, however, Earth system models display significant uncertainties in decadal projections of Arctic sea ice decline. Um, and therefore, predictions of when a virtually ice-free Arctic can be expected are also uncertain. So we thought it would be um, a very, very good opportunity to bring in some two very distinguished uh, scientists, Alexandra Yan and Jingwa Duanding, uh, to talk about this, uh, this problem in particular. Um, so we'll start off with uh, Alexandra Yan. She's Associate Professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences of the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, she's also affiliated with the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research, and she received a PhD uh, from McGill University in 2010. And so the title of her presentation is Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Projections of a First versus Consistently Ice-Free Arctic. Alexander, uh, please take it away. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction, Robert. So um, let me get that sharing. Okay, can does that look good? Looks great. Looks yeah. awesome. Okay, great. Okay, good. So yeah, thank um thanks a lot for for the invitation and for having this webinar and for coming. Um, so I look forward to the discussions. Um, and um, this is part of a review paper that I've uh, wrote with Mariko Holland at NCAR and Jennifer Kay at CU Boulder, um, on projections of an ice free Arctic. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about some of the things that we points that we raised in that review in, in the next 10-15 uh, minutes. Um, so first, um, an ice-free Arctic um, is also sometimes thought of as the transition from a white to a blue Arctic. And that's because uh, an ice-free Arctic is a regime shift from having a perennial sea ice cover to a seasonal cover in the Arctic. Um, and so here are just some images kind of illustrating this white to blue transition with um, historical um, sea ice concentrations in September. So the Arctic still being primarily white, kind of average of last uh, couple years with kind of a white and blue. And then an ice free Arctic, which is defined as uh, 1 million square kilometers of aerial sea ice cover in the Arctic. Um, where there is still some sea ice um, in the Arctic, but it's all um, located north of Greenland in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago and in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. So the central Arctic is ice-free. And so that's nearly ice-free, as Wilbert was saying. Um, and uh, that's usually referred to just as ice-free using this one million square kilometer threshold rather than actual zero um, ice-free, which one might think of when one hears that for the first time. Um, and... Uh, um, in terms of projections of um, that, um, again, um, it, we usually um, look at projections of an ice-free Arctic in September, because that's the first months of the year that we expect ice-free conditions to occur in the monthly mean. Um, and so this blue uh, curve, the ensemble mean with the blue shading um, as the range uh, from the from selected seam of six models, looking at a future ice-free state um, in September. And so we can see while there is a decrease in the sea ice cover throughout the year um, in that projection, um, we only have ice-free conditions in September when that starts and we still have the sea ice coming back in the winter time. Um, and so what are the current projections of an ice-free Arctic? Well, we already alluded to the fact there's a huge spread in the Earth system models and that has persisted for several generations of these models. 
So here we're just looking at the CMIP-6 um, projections based on the CI CMIP community paper in 2020, um, where we looked at um, uh, the available model simulations from four different um, emission scenario, going from the uh, smallest future emissions and SSP-119 to the highest emission scenario, the SSP-585 in red, um, and um, looking at all the models that were available at the time, um, was the number of model set, model simulation included given up here. Um, and then the top row is the number of model simulations that have not reached ice-free conditions by the end of these 21st century simulations. Um, and primarily we're gonna be focusing on the selected models that were selected in that uh, community paper based on the performance, uh, uh, performance characteristics um, over the historical period. Um, so, um, and that's become kind of common and we'll hear more about that in the next talk too. Um, trying to constrain projections because there's such a huge spread in the raw model projections. So trying to either do model selections um, based on historical performance um, or do uh, model recalibration or other um, observational constraints um, to um, narrow the range of, uh, of, of projections within the known uh, internal variability projection uncertainty, which is about 20 years. But let's come back to this figure here. So focusing on the selected models, uh, one of the main takeaways here was that um, the occurrence of the first ice-free Arctic is really primarily going to be determined by internal variability, not by scenario differences. And we can see that very clearly here, where we have um, a very similar, actually, early ice-free Arctics um, that are happening under the lowest emission scenario and the highest. Um, and so it really comes down to the individual realization um, due to internal variability. occur rather than um, the, the forcing. We don't see a strong impact of that. Um, and so in the review, we kind of um, looked at that, um, the exact same models, um, but just looking at that a little bit different in terms of looking at the percentage of the models that have at least one occurrence of ice-free conditions. And we can see that um, we reach this likely that we have seen ice-free condition 66% probability. So in the IPCC talk, that's, uh, that gets into the likely range. Um, um, we will have seen first ice-free conditions uh, likely before the mid-century, and uh, that actually is here in this case for these models already, like that it's likely to occur before 2040 um, based on the selection. And we can see that um, these models, even though they're selected ones, they're already starting to um, show put, uh, first ice-free conditions occurring in some of these members um, uh, before uh, 2020. Um, and so um, that's also one of the reasons why there um, has been more work done also on, on recalibrating them um, based on observations, um, if they're already in the mean state, if they're too low um, to kind of see how that impacts the predictions. Um, uh, so in looking through all the previous work on an ice-free Arctic, um, it, it became very quickly, very apparent that there are very many different definitions of an ice-free Arctic, which makes it very challenging to compare um, existing um, predictions. Um, so I, I said the 1 million square kilometers threshold, that is pretty well established. Early work used um, actual zero area or zero extent, um, but in the last uh, de decade, decade and a half, the 1 million square kilometers threshold has been very well established in terms of the ice uh, to define ice free. Um, but initially it was primarily using CS extent and then lately, there's been a shift to use more CS areas, specifically for model intercomparisons. Um, and um, so um, we can define it based on CS area and extent. And that actually leads to, leads to different projections and uh, pr predictions of early of ice-free conditions. And I'll show you that um, in two slides. Another one that's been used, including in the um, uh, IPCC reports, uh, was the first time the five-year running mean of the monthly CNAS area or extent is less than 1 million square kilometer. Um, also been looked at um, the first time the five-year CIS extent is less than one million square kilometer and then is below one million square kilometer in consequent years um, in, that in that month. So not year round, but like September and then next September and September after that and so on. Um, also, some studies have used the first time a longer term running mean of the monthly mean CIS area or extent is less than one million square kilometers, so 10 or 20 years. Um, and also sometimes the first time the ensemble mean, either of a large ensemble or of a multi-model mean is less than uh, one million square kilometer. And um, 
you might already um, kind of realize that these will probably lead to very to, to big differences in the projections. Um, and so um, we in the review kind of um, suggested to, to be very clear um, in future work um, in what ice what ice free projection um, is being talked about. Are we talking about the first ice free? So like the earliest possible um, ice free conditions that um, we expect to occur or the first time this happens, or do we are we talking about consistently ice free conditions where after after that date is um, hit and as long as temperatures continue to increase afterwards, ice free conditions are more likely than not to occur in subsequent years. Um, and so we can see that if we just look at a monthly mean of just one ensemble member of one large ensemble here um, in the red line in terms of the CS extent, we can see that that first reaches ice free conditions in um, 2038 um, over here. Whereas if we look at the five year running mean of that same uh, ensemble member CS extent, we see that first ice free conditions are only reached in 2047. And so we call the months using the raw monthly mean, the first ice free and the five year running mean, the consistently ice free. Um, and so we see that um, using these different um, approaches really matters, um, leads to an almost a decade earlier consistently ice free Arctic um, and just um, depending on how exactly you're calculating your ice free dates. Similarly, if we use extent versus area, again, earlier work tended to use um, CS extent. Um, and some more of the more recent work then starting to use more CS area. So if we look, this is just the extent again. So 2038, we um, we then look at the CS area from the same model. You can see the same ensemble member, same general variability, just slightly lower because we're just looking at the actual area, not the extent where we're um, counting all the grid boxes with 15% or more CIs, uh, but counting then the whole area. And we can see that the CS area reaches ice free conditions for the first time in 2029. Um, so again, uh, a decade earlier than for CIS extent. And similarly, um, if we look at the five year running means, um, it uh, the consistently ice free conditions in the area occur in 2040 uh, for the first time compared to 2047 if you're using CIS extent. And again, so using, depending on what you're using um, to calculate ice-free uh, conditions in a study, we can get differences of um, a decade um, or five years. Um, and that uh, is something that would kind of, if we just compare the studies without taking that into account, um, one would have the impression that there's something new going on or the models are different, but sometimes that might just be looking at area versus extent. Um, so this was just kind of an example to illustrate that. Um, we looked at that in the CMOP6 models, again, the selected CMOP6 models here using CIS area. And again, we see very clearly that if we use the monthly mean for like the for the first ice free that occurs um, earlier in all the models compared to using uh, the five year running mean, the five years in a row or the 20 year running mean, these other definitions that have been used. And we kind of put those all in one bucket as consistently ice-free because they kind of generally describe a similar um, situation, even though the exact timing is still um, can be still significantly different depending on how much you smooth it. But they generally um, kind of are aiming for the middle of the distribution. Um, if we're looking at a large ensemble, kind of similar to where the ensemble mean would go ice-free um, and um, where, um, it's more of the force response that we're focusing on here, the consistently ice free, where it's the first ice free, looking at um, the first res the force response plus um, the possibility of an early ice free Arctic the first time that that can happen. Um, furthermore, this was just looking at the SSP 585 in the last slide. If we look at all the different scenarios that we looked at, we can see that actually the difference between the first ice free and the consistently ice free. Um, this offset here um, is uh, smaller for the uh, higher forcing scenarios. And that makes sense because we're um, decreasing the ice faster um, in those and uh, decreasing it further than in the lower forcing scenarios, in particular the SSP 126 or the 119, which actually goes to negative emissions and has CO2 coming down after mid-century. Um, and so um, again, these differences in definitions, they don't even just, we can just say there's a standard offset but it between first and consistent ice free, but um, depending on the forcing scenario, we do actually have a different offset there. 
Um, so another way to look at ice-free conditions that um, we kind of um, like and um, kind of suggest um, is, and we're not the only ones who've used it, but that is very useful to kind of get around this is to use a pro uh, look at probability of ice-free conditions in a given year, because it includes both information on the occurrence of first ice-free conditions, which yes, statistically are very unlikely, um, uh, but um, that's uh, that's when they could ice-free conditions could first occur based on the model simulations. Um, and then um, compared to consistently ice-free conditions when um, it becomes likely or very likely, uh, depending on what, you, what one as a user or reader would kind of define as consistently ice-free conditions. Um, it also clearly shows the differences, the scenario impact where we see that there's no difference really between the scenarios, the um, the weaker one actually having um, a higher probability um, of uh, ice-free conditions and then the other one. So no impact of scenario differences or, um, on the first ice-free conditions um, all the way up until here. And then they're starting to see a big impact of scenario differences. So there is still um, um, a lot of sea ice to save uh, as we, if we wanna say it that way, um, if re emissions are reduced, uh, we can see a very a different probability of ice-free conditions in a given year under the different scenarios looked at. And again, this one, it actually gets colder again because um, atmospheric CO2 comes back down under negative emissions. Um, and again, it kind of puts um, uh, more information out there. So other, it's easier to kind of compare with other studies. Um, we can also do that for other months of the year. Again, we start with September because that's when we um, expect the first ice-free conditions to occur. Um, and recently, there's a lot of papers, kind of, uh, like some press around a uh, recent paper that said like the loss of September sea ice may now be unavoidable at least once. Um, but there's still a lot of sea ice. Um, th there's still a lot of scenario differences um, between these different scenarios, even uh, because um, we can look at uh, SSP 8.5, the probability of ice-free conditions in a given year, virtually certain. So over 99% in this dark blue here under the RCP 8.5 for five months a year was a possibility of ice-free conditions for another four months of the year. Obviously, that would be a fundamentally different Arctic than an Arctic that occasionally goes ice-free um, every decade or something, even if it's potentially for up to three months um, a year, but as an unlikely event that only happens. Um, every decade or two. Um, and so um, I think um, now that we looked a lot at September, um, looking more at ice-free conditions, other months of the year, and the impacts of those, um, I think is really relevant as well. And finally, um, a definition that hasn't really been looked at um, is actually looking at the daily ice-free, because obviously um, the Arctic will go ice-free first in the daily observations and the daily data before it can be ice-free in the monthly data. And um, I think that's really important to communicate and to start looking at that since we are now having daily output of CS concentrations and climate models even for CMUP6 um, because um, ice-free conditions in the daily data will occur earlier. That's how we expect. And here's just looking at one of the large ensembles, in this case, the CSM2 large ensemble. Um, and we can see that sometimes um, um, we see monthly and daily ice-free conditions occurring at in the same year, um, but sometimes there is a big offset where the monthly occurs much, much later than when first daily ice-free conditions occur. And this is kind of looking at the year of an ice-free Arctic and the offset. So we can see that the offset is smaller for very early ice-free years, but especially for uh, ensemble members that go ice-free late. Um, we can see a very big offset. So we can start seeing ice-free conditions for a day or a couple days a month, um, but not in the monthly mean yet. And I think that's really important. So we don't get caught um, kind of like, oh, we've only predicted ice-free conditions to first occur um, maybe in the 2030s, but maybe we'll see ice-free conditions in just one month, uh, in one daily um, observational data bef uh, before that. So I think that's important. So just to summarize, Predictions of an ice-free Arctic are affected by how ice-free conditions are defined. And um, ice predictions of an ice-free Arctic should differentiate between a first possible ice-free Arctic and consistently ice-free conditions. And um, I think it'd be really great if the community kind of agrees on some terms, doesn't have to be consistently ice-free or some, but could be something like that, but just kind of more clearly defining what ice-free is really meant, especially when communicating that. And it also, um, if we could agree on common definitions of ice-free for these two kind of types, then that would also facilitate better comparisons between different 
um, studies and especially different methods of refining projections. And we'll hear more about that in the next talk, um, which currently is really difficult because a lot of things are different, different models are used, different definitions are used, and then different refinement methods are used, making it very challenging to kind of compare different studies there. Um, by showing the probability of ice-free conditions in a given year, the analysis does not have to be limited to just focusing on early ice-free and consistently ice-free, it can show both. And while the loss of September sea ice at least once may now be unavoidable, there is a big difference in how frequently ice-free conditions will occur and for how many months a year they may occur, depending on future emissions. And I think that's a really important message um, to get out there as well. So thank you very much. I don't know if there's any questions. I don't know if Wilbert's still here. Yeah, uh, I'm. Uh, it looks like Wilbert, are you? If you are trying to come off of mute, uh, we cannot hear you. Um. There you go. We got you now. What do you? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Oh, interesting. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I was I was talking all the while, I suppose. Um, <laughs> thanks very much for the uh, very insightful presentation, Alex. Um, let's let's um, maybe if if there is one or two clarifying questions um, before I'm handing it over to the next speaker, um, and please uh, maybe raise your hand or um, and note that after the next presentation, we'll have some time hopefully for uh, more extensive discussions. Yeah, you want to go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, I, my question is uh, uh, from uh, in the past a uh, hundred or something or two hundred years, and we can we can see the multi decadal oscillation in the Arctic sea ice. Uh, I wonder why, for the future projection, this kind of phenomenon is gone. I wonder. Maybe these are for the ensemble, they are the face uh, cancel out each other. Uh, if you look at the individual model, uh, you can see multi decadal oscillation uh, in the CI signal. Okay, and um, well, I, I, I think they continue into the future from what I've looked at in model simulations. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're looking at ensemble means, then they should be averaged out um, if they're not forced um, and they wouldn't be forced in the future. If they were forced in the past, then maybe maybe that would be the reason if there is an actual forcing behind it, like uh, volcanic or something like that, because that doesn't continue into the future. But what, from what I've looked at large ensembles, they do still have multi-decadal variability. And that's why we have also such a large internal variability uncertainty in the future projections of an ice-free Arctic. And some methods to refine, potentially refine the projection are tied to these multi-decadal modes variability and trying to use, um, for example, climate variability, uh, climate indices like the uh, Pacific interdecadal oscillation or something to look at which mode are we currently in, when do we expect it to shift to the other mode. And there, there was a paper by Screen and Desser looking at that and kind of seeing like how um, like what's the difference in ice-free conditions within one ensemble um, based on the mode of of the IPO that we're in um, that that at the start that model members were in at the start and how long it took for them to go ice-free depending on that and so I think that is definitely still there in in the future as far as I've seen uh, obviously I haven't looked at every single large ensemble but I've looked at several in depth and they still have um, modes of variability sometimes then they cut off when the Arctic goes ice free um, so in September, but in other months, we still see that as well. So I might mm -hmm. be missing something that you referred to. So. Okay. Uh, Mike, do you have a quick question or like a more discussion? Well, well, I'm just curious on this issue of 1 million square kilometers. Is, is that something that's really well defined in models compared to observations? Um, you know, it, 
doesn't that just complicate everything? Um, I mean, well, I don't know what you mean, well defined. Um, it's, um, I mean, it goes back to um, the Wong and Overland papers, as far as I'm aware of, and um, and because it's, yeah, it's like the Arctic well, is completely ice free. Um, I mean, it's it's well defined in, in models, definitely, because there we have absolute answers, right? <laughs> um, um, and in the observations, um, I think, but yeah, we would get that very similar as well. I mean, we see here, I'm showing like some of the uncertainty based on satellite observations, whether you use the NASA team or the bootstrap. Um, so definitely, yeah, that one of them might be ice-free and the other one might not be. Um, but uh, yeah, looking at fully ice-free, that would add another decade or two um, because that's just the very thickest ice and yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about just ruling it that area out when you count or something like that. I mean, the Canadian archipelago is so complex. Yeah. Uh, it seems... Yeah, then I, I mean, it's a small area that's within the, the models definitely would have a much, much harder time of getting that correctly. Yeah, you're right there. So, yeah. Um, so it might also be us putting a mask on kind of the last sea ice area and the archipelago and kind of looking at, at the, then looking at zero after you mask that or something. No, that might not be a bad way to, to try and look how that compares. So I like that idea. <laughs> All right. Great, thanks. Let's hand it over to Xinhua. Uh, okay. He's associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, he's also affiliated with the Earth Research Institute. And he received his PhD from the University of Hawaii in 2008. Um, and his presentation is entitled Improving Arctic Climate Projections Through Observation Constrained Model Capabilities. Okay, thank you. I hope I start to share my screen, so I hope everyone can see my slide. Not, yeah, perfect, that looks great. Okay, thank you. Uh, I really thank appreciate, you. Uh, yeah, I have this opportunity to give a talk, and uh, it's great, I, my talk is after uh, Alexandra's talk, and uh, her, I really like her talk, because uh, she emphasized uh, uh, definition of the uh, definition of the ice free matter. Uh, here, I really want to emphasize another aspect is that not only definition, but also uh, uh, choices of uh, the model or how to process a model also matter for uh, for the future to gain some like the future uh, projection in the Arctic region. So this is the collaborative work with many, many people. You can see here have a really long list of the collaborators. So I have no time to read uh, read out all their, their name. So uh, the, the main goal is that try to see how to improve a future projection in the Arctic using something we call the observation constraint uh, uh, capability, model capability. So this is still a very new concept developed by ourselves. Uh, so we know that uh, Blue Arctic is the global, uh, is important issue for the uh, international community due to many, many reasons and many, many sector. And uh, this. Yeah, so if we if we see the observation and uh, uh, over the past 40 years, since 1979, this is the this is September sea ice, total sea ice area. So this is the, the purple line and this is seem to be, we still have two weeks to the minimum time this year, but it seems like the, this year will be around here, just cross cross the sign here. So it seems like the, the observational record of Arctic sea ice in September seem to uh, consists of a three different epoch. One thing is like the slight decline trend, or we call a moderate decline trend, and followed by some really, really accelerated uh, decline, uh, things like 2000 to 2012. Then the recent 10 years seem to be really uh, stay in some like a steady state, kind of, still have some decline. But overall, this is a decline trend. We know this as a general fall thing. Uh, so this is a really some important issue for our model community to project the future in the next uh, in the next coming decade because the we, maybe we will see two different scenarios one thing, one thing is the we will see this one will reappear just like this a six year uh, no this the middle part will reappear so we will see quickly see this the uh, fast melting and uh, this the blue arctic in the near future maybe by the two, by the 2000 2040 another one maybe we will see some slowdown sign or maybe a minor recovery it's hard right because the, it's so complex and the model have a large uncertainty uh, but why we have this three different epoch is hard to 
because so many reasons have have been raised to explain this, maybe due to the volcanic eruption, some volcanic or some like a negative feedback, offset global warming. Or another reason is maybe due to this period, some internal variability accelerates this melting. So it's because it's melted too fast due to internal variability. So that gave us some like the the like the like the picture, like the, the melting should be like this always, right? Uh, so these are the two paper, very nice paper, have argued same way some, somehow, uh, because they argue like the AA, they define AA as something like a ratio of uh, temperature in the Arctic over the global mean temperature. And uh, they, they also realize probably uh, this is recent AA effect, like this one, the four times stronger, uh, four times uh, the ratio is a four over like the global mean uh, warming signal. So this warming is observation and no model can just to capture the similar amount of the warming uh, intensity in the Arctic. So they argue probably due to internal variability. Another paper argued the same way, this one is observation and a model always gives a little bit lower warming intensity in the Arctic. So internal is important. But next the question is that, what is this internal variability? Uh, so this, I just to give you the idea is that uh, maybe this is one possible dynamic origin of this so-called internal variability. Uh, we call this is the park mode, just like a Pacific Arctic teleconnection. And uh, so you can see just uh, briefly, you can see that the mechanism operate like this way, just uh, over the past 40 years, there's a cooling effect in the tropical ocean. It's not classical ENSO, it's a little different, different mode than ENSO. And there's a cooling pattern, especially over like the Eastern Pacific, Eastern Central Pacific, it's a cooling generally to wave train, it's a wave train propagated to the Arctic region and the general high pressure over Greenland and also part of the Arctic. And this high pressure will generate like the, like the uh, like a polar heat wave or like the heat dome that term, right, heat dome due to subsidence and friction, maybe long wave radiation, cloud also involved in this process. So eventually fav favors the CS melting. Uh, so this is the, to, to, to better understand this mode, uh, we, we look some like a past of 400 years of data using some reconstruction data that is the merge, just blend the model with some uh, proxy data together. So we can see this mode exists over the past 400 years, actually. And like this pattern, just a low, high, low, high, that's low low cooling in the tropical Pacific ex excite this mode and the probably to the polar region. And if you look at this temporal variability, we see there's a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong multi-decadal uh, variability, probably around like a 30, 40 years period. And uh, so this is the reason, so I just, uh, this is a recent, like oscillation over just since the 1970s. You can see there's a lower, like the negative, like the negative uh, regime, then quickly switch to the positive regime, then there is like the, like the turning back, something like that. So this is a detailed figure for this curve. You can see 1970s and the, the negative regime and the turn to the positive regime and turn back. So that is the 2012. So if you compare with the CS chain, it seems like this upward trend since the 2000 to 2012 can partially explain this accelerated trend. Uh, so this is some, my thought, just a, our thought to explain why over the past 400, uh, 40, 40 years, CS behaved like this way. Uh, Asperogenic forcing is a background of warming, warm Arctic more, but uh, on top of it's the uh, warming due to the asperogenic forcing, probably there's an internal mode strengthening or mask or uh, interact with uh, its aspergenic signal to uh, to uh, modulate, regulate uh, regulate this the, the total total behavior of the CS chain. So how this change will behave in the future, we don't know. But probably we will still need to keep eye on this the tropical uh, cooling pattern. How that will change in the future? But I will I will give some idea because the, it seems like the currently our model cannot well capture the signal. So that is the big challenge for the community to. Uh, simulate or predict this mode, how this mode behave in the future. Uh, then I want to see, uh, I want to see that uh, that's the big problem, big issue for our future projection because the projection in the future really depends on how we use our model. And uh, currently we have a two main method. One thing is called a model de democracy, just like using all the model available in the CMD6, CMD5, and all the model add them together, look at the future trend. Normally, this is the older version plot. You can see basically we have this red curve, 
like the insan for me or like a cindy six like it's a blue curve and uh, another idea proposed recently is called like the model uh, meritocracy just means the the select the best group uh, based on some some criteria, then using that one to do future projection because we think that this group, this subgroup is better than other model, uh, the rest of the, the in the group to capture some observation feature. So, but by doing this, basically we just uh, capture some model because we try to match the, the part of the, the subgroup with observation and we know observation is faster than the group, the, the example mean. So please, the, Naturally, we select some like the model very sensitive to CO2 forcing. So if we keep using the same model for the future projection, probably we will get some model have an earlier uh, uh, onset of its ice freeze than the, the enzyme pulmon. Uh, so my question here is that do we need a third pass to do something uh, like future projection? So this is a, the, the one we proposed. It's called observation constraint because the, uh, in my uh, previous slide, we have argued there's like the like this mode and this mode we tried we, we know is somehow like internal variability so try to remove this from observation because the we we don't expect to see the perfect match between the example mean and the observation because the observation contain two components right if we, if if our argument is right because the observation contain two components but the blue curve only contain Force of force response. So we should see some like the mismatch. The discrepancy doesn't matter because the discrepancy means that we have a two different uh, target, right? So so then we argue that maybe remove internal variability first from both model and observation. Only compare residual part. If a residual part, so the so the so we want to see the match over the residual part rather than the raw part. This is our main argument. So by doing this, basically we find the model is not uh, is less is not as less sensitive. Basically, it's a little bit uh, over sensitive to the global warming. Then we find that basically by doing this, we find the model maybe uh, if we consider that uh, a condition, probably we will see all the model using this idea do this adjustment. Probably will give us like a delay warming, delay ice, delay occurrence of ice free than the uh, global. Uh, then this uh, example average. So this is our argument, and here is the result. So to do this, we use some, we use some method called R, uh, just a residual trend. Residual trend just like the, we remove this internal variability. We have some method just a linear regress out some wind like circulation related warming from observation first, and also from model we do the both and uh, compare with the raw trend and look at this ratio. And uh, if you look at the different uh, variable in the Arctic, and we find all the models. So this side is a raw trend, and this side is a residual. Just remove this, uh, we call it internal pattern, like a circulation driven warming. If we remove this one, all the model doesn't change. It still stay, stay in this uh, diagonal line. That means that even remove the circulation pattern, the, the, trend, the residual trend and raw trend is the same magnitude. It's still, the ratio is a one. So that means the model doesn't care about this circulation pattern. But if you're using the same method in the observation, all this trend decrease a little bit to something like a 75, 70%, depending on the different variable. If you look at uh, uh, Arctic Sea, Arctic uh, uh, surface air temperature or over different region and the sea ice, or like a drop. But model doesn't, doesn't change too much. So this means that this mode cannot, cannot be well captured by model. All the melting in the model even like individual member is something related to the uh, anthropogenic fault rather than this dynamical impact. So by considering this, we adjust the future projection. We assume uh, the sensitivity to CO2 won't change too much in the future. And we, and we know the model somehow lacks some capability to capture some dynamical reason, dynamical mechanism. So we adjust this. We find uh, using the same criteria by the Alexandra. And it seems like the, if you're using a raw projection, that is the 2035 some model, but if I consider this the lower sensitivity issue, the model gave us like the 10 years later. And the different model gave the same, same like delay. So, and the CIMB6 also shows it's a kind of the delay. So it seems like the all the model show like a 10 year delay than the example without this adjustment. Uh, so this is the main idea here. So that's the two slides. Is the uh, why model cannot capture this, uh, we call the 
internal mechanism. We think it's because we know that our tropical forcing is important. So we looked at something we call a ratio of a low frequency SAT over the total SAT variance. So this is a plot for the different season, JJA, annual mean. And the first, the top, top, uh, the pan, the top, uh, a row is like an observation, and the second, the middle, and the lower is for a model. So we're using the individual member to do this and add them together uh, in for the model. So you can see the model can well capture this the ENSO mode, just like a high frequency two to eight years high frequency oscillation in the tropical region. So this is observation and this is a model. But for the low frequency, it's the eight to forty years because we, we know some modes mainly oscillate around this frequency band. So we focus on this 40 years, eight to 40 years band. We find observations also show this uh, like a dominancy of this uh, band over this part, but the model cannot capture this really well. If you look at the annual mean, this uh, low frequency oscillation really strong. It's like the 30% over this area, but the model still only captures 10%. So that means the low frequency oscillation in the tropical region is so low uh, in, in all the model, even in individual member. Uh, so that is the teleconnection part. So we're using some method called uh, SOM. It's a self-organization map, just like a nonlinear UF. And uh, we put model there, see how model capture up the capture is the teleconnection. So you can see this is a tele teleconnection mode. So cooling SAT can generate the mode to the high pressure over Arctic. But if you look at each model, so we can group or is the performance of each model to like a six group. Most of the model, even they can capture cooling here, but they cannot generate high pressure here. It seems that only one model is a one out of a 34 model, semi six model. They can generate cooling, but uh, high pressure is the, it's much weaker than observation. Uh, we, we do something additional analysis. It seems like the, the mean state maybe has some bias that doesn't favor the generation of this uh, teleconnection to the polar region or due to the uh, too low, uh, low frequency SAT variability. Yeah, this is my final page. Just like the, uh, we know the circulation is important and uh, it's matter if we consider this impact and based on this, we can do some adjustment. We find a model, if we consider that effect, model should give us like a slower or delay uh, ice-free uh, ice uh, currency. And we need to really understand why that, why model cannot capture that. And, uh, and uh, so yeah, now, so we have a three different uh, projection. One thing is using is the democracy idea as a blue one, and or we're using like the best group. We we think based on some like a criteria to match observation over the past four years. Maybe we can capture this a really sensitive group, which is a red group. And uh, but if we consider like the, if we consider we shouldn't see the perfect match, right? We we consider that and we adjust this. Maybe we can get some like a yellow group that is a give a delay, uh, delay uh, ice free uh, summer uh, currency. Yeah, so I want to stop here and to see any questions from our audience. Awesome, thanks very much, Ingwa. It's a very interesting presentation and a really nice compliment to what uh, Alex has shown. Um, shown, yeah, demonstrating for instance, the impact of low frequency climate variability on the on Arctic predictability, very nice. Um, so let's open it up for questions. Um, if you have a question, then just uh, raise your hand. I got one question, Jingwa. Um, you, you showed uh, the 400-year time series of that uh, that part mode. Was it based on observations or reanalysis product or or models? Yeah, it's if people call that a reconstruction or call the uh, past uh, millennium a uh, uh, p look. Yeah, it's the merge of the uh, model and the proxy data, something like the coral data and the ice core data and training data everywhere. Yeah, so it's half half okay. <laughs> because we don't have a really okay. good observation, right? Yes, yeah. yes, right, right. Great, thanks. Um, Mike? Um, thanks. I, I'm, and this could actually go to both of the speakers, but I'm wondering if any of these models are considering the effects of reduced maritime emissions of SO2 and sulfate on the future. And I mean, that sulfate might well be uh, having uh, in the past brightened clouds uh, and and you know there is this question of whether it is the marine cloud. I mean, the reduction in emissions that is helping make this year's warming particularly strong. And then even going back further in the in the with respect to the Arctic, 
It used to be that most SO2 emissions were sort of coming out of the Atlantic Basin nations, and then we cleared up pollution and it did that, for example, reduce the brightness of clouds in the Arctic. And now the sulfur main SO2 emissions are from Southeast or East Asia and, and that area and, and changing clouds. Do any of the models include these kinds of sulfate related effects and possible cloud brightening? I know where I know very little about this. Um, yeah, I'm not an expert on that, but I'm. I think they do include that. I mean, and definitely for the for the historical simulations, they they include the sulfur emissions. I would think that they do that as part of the emission scenarios, but I don't know because I've never like plotted it, so I can't tell you for sure. Um, oh. if they don't, then that would definitely be like something that yeah would be definitely worth like some sensitivity studies to kind of see what the impact of that is but um i know that like it includes so many other emissions like biomass burning and um black carbon emissions and so i would be surprised if they don't include that in the future scenarios um but i can't vouch so maybe someone else here knows because they've actually there was a study i don't remember the exact reference maybe a decade or more ago that took the sulfate out of uh, the Arctic, um, and was wondering if that was a cause of or a contributor to the accelerated um, loss of ice. Um, because if you basically get the sulfate out and the clouds are less bright, you're probably going to get an earlier snow melt on the surface of the ice and start melting it back. But now that the marine community is sort of reducing SO2 emissions, this might be something really interesting to look at. Thanks. Yeah, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, uh, I think I'd like to see the, you know, not all the model can produce internal variability. And particularly for the decadal to multi decadal uh, variability. Uh, this kind of variability should be controlled by the ocean, not from the atmosphere, not by the atmosphere. Uh, because if you look at the indices uh, development, used to be used uh, sea level pressure difference uh, for ENSO, for, uh, for other things. And right now, major, uh, uh, well, like a PDO, and MO, and even answer, answer right now use sea level, uh, use surface sea temperature uh, normally. So if you choose, uh, not all the model can produce these kind of things, the variability. So when you select a model, you should individual, individual uh, choose individual model using, for example, uh, EOF analysis or kind of the uh, complex EOF analysis with atmosphere to choose the good model which can produce into annual and also uh, that's on the sea level pressure, uh, sea level temperature anomaly rather than uh, sea level pressure. That is a, it's a short, short life. Only ocean variability is a long life. A long leap. So we should choose carefully each uh, CMEX six model uh, with this uh, well, criteria. For example, this model can produce interannual variability or not, or decadal variability or not. If not, you should not use use them, uh, including Sanger's uh, comparison. Uh, the, the, I think that is uh, we should. Uh, should keep in mind, I think, uh, uh, atmosphere is not produced this kind of the long-term uh, variability, uh, only the ocean. So we should look at ocean variability first and choose the, uh, choose the, 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 the model, limited model. Yeah, uh, great, yeah. It's an integrated problem, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Alex. 
Yeah, a very nice con um, presentation. Um, and like, I think it was your second to last slide. I don't know if you can bring that up again. Like, so you showed the observation and then like, did you show specific models that were doing well with representing that um, that park? Yeah, that one or was, yeah, I, I kind of, I was typing something in the chat and I think I lost something there. So I was just wondering, like, did you find specific models that did that well? Like kind of alluding to the fact maybe looking at just the subset of models that do this well, or? Um... Yeah, but even this model do does well, it seems like maybe just by chance. And uh, uh, it's a very preliminary uh, analysis. We need to do more to see, uh, but the main argument is still like the only one out of 34, right? It seems like the only 3% of 5% model can capture this. And it's, it's, it's a very common problem for all the models to capture this mode, because if we want to do the future projection, future projection is a more model, we need maybe more model uh, have this uh, this this skill. Okay, so this uh, was okay. so you looked at yeah models. yeah. So we we don't know why the, the problem is we, even we have this the, the finding, but we still don't know why this model captured this and the, uh, why other model cannot <laughs> because mm -hmm. there's so many so many constraints, so many factors could could determine this. Maybe just by chance, right? Or sampling sampling reason because the. We just using this forty years do this analysis and uh, by chance capture this mode, uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, but well, that's really interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we still need yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I agree with uh, uh, Doctor Ding, and we should select the uh, model which can reproduce the internal variability because the trend, the trend. Sometimes for the internal variability multiplicator trend is upward, upward variability that will be very significant. The warming is or cooling is um, more significant than the 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 the, uh, uh, the global warming. So uh, we should keep in mind this, and we we cannot just uh, put all the model together and then uh, cancel out all the variability and only leave the train there. And that is not, uh, <laughs> uh, that is, uh, uh, we, we, in order to get the train and we remove the variability. Thank you. But I think there's also, do we want the variability or not? Like for first ice free, that's all internal variability. Um, for the mean, then, then we don't want it, then we want to take that out and, so I think, again, it's a question of what we want to predict as well. All right, great. At least the uh, multi-decadal variability should be in the signal uh, because uh, the magnitude of the warming magnitude caused by the multi-decadal oscillation is more significant, is uh, larger than the, the global warming in some, in, in certain periods. Okay, um, let's let's move on to the next question, and maybe there's some uh, more discussion to be had by email if that's um, um, useful. Um, so Lars, it's probably just um, going to be the the last question of this session. Wilbert, bef before we jump to Lars, sorry, uh, Lars, I, I'm just worried we're going to lose people in one minute. So I just wanted to take a moment to draw folks' attention to uh, the next meetings of the modelers team. Uh, that Wilbert placed in the chat. I believe there's also a really relevant uh, meeting from the IARPIC sea ice uh, team, uh, community of practice. Um, and I think Angela is gonna put that information in the chat or maybe in a couple of minutes, make a, a brief announcement if you're able to stay on Angela. Um, for folks that are able to, we'll keep the Zoom open for another five minutes or so um, for one or two more questions. Um, and no problem if you need to drop off. As a reminder, the recording will be posted on the IRPIC Collaborations website. I'll also put the chat there. There was so much good discussion there and I found it hard to listen and follow that along with that. So take a look at the comments um, on the IRPIC website on this meeting page if you uh, wanna review that after the call. Um, and again, uh, Apologies, Lars, for jumping in. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, very nice presentations and maybe a suggestion for a, another meeting or, or, or set of presentations then. But I was 
wondering about winter sea ice loss as well. And, and, and you know, I agree on the natural variability that's kind of highlighted by the second talk here. And also this link with Arctic amplification, I think, is intriguing. And Arctic amplification largely happens in winter, right? And, and if you look at it spatially, it happens in the barren sector. And of course, the Atlantic inflow is roughly 10 Svergeps versus the inflow in the Bering Strait is roughly one Svergep. So, so the ocean plays a much more dominant role on the Atlantic side. So I guess the simple short question to Alex is, 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 you know, did you also look at winter sea ice variability and winter ice loss and uh, and, and are the models doing okay there? Uh, you know, and then it would be dominated in the Barrent sector, I think, uh, at least in the observations that were, that's where the largest ice loss is in winter. Thank you. Yeah, I haven't specifically looked at the winter, but I agree if that's definitely important. And um, often also for the model selection, we tend to focus on just using criteria for um, using the seasonal cycle. So that includes some of the winter, but not the winter loss necessarily, just that the models get about the right amplitude. And then um, a lot of the the loss loss criteria are more tied to the Septembers. So I think that's that's important too, to kind of consider at least also March sea ice loss or something too, for, for model selection, um, if, if that's the way to go kind of to, to go away from the model democracy and kind of just choose the models that, that are best for that. And, and yes, it's, they should be good for both the winter and the summer. Um, and so maybe that's, that's the models that remain that actually are good for both. Um, so that like we have more confidence in, in the physics being actually right for the right reasons. If they can match multiple parts of the seasonal cycle. Um, and another part is that a lot of the model selection isn't necessarily done on spatial. Um, and I think that is something that's really important to kind of go further than just Panarctic um, like averages to kind of get these things, these differences between the Pacific sector and the Atlantic sector and, and things like that. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. And I think a meeting and there's lots of discussions about that. And other people have done more work on the winter than, than I have. That would be great for that. Um, I think would be really, really good so, to kind of talk more just about model selection and in the Arctic sea ice and how do we want to do this and kind of come up with a like more of a community because everyone kind of does their own thing and <laughs> some people like what someone did so they do it too but it's not too much of that yet so almost every paper has a different selection which again makes it very hard to compare different studies and say like oh this is actually this seems to be better than the other one because you can't easily compare it because they use different models different selection <laughs> different periods it's, it's it's a really big mess and so right now and which is the part where lots of like people try lots of things, which is important, but if it hopes maybe at some point we're at that stage where we can say like, okay, this is the best way to do it. And um, as a community, can we agree on that and go use that going forward? Thanks. <laughs> Great. So I was told that Alex uh, really had to hard stop at 12.05. Um, so maybe we should stop it here. Uh, Richard, uh, is it okay to not? Ask your question, and maybe you can follow up with Alex or um, Jingwa um, afterwards. That's fine. All right. Thank you. Well, we did. Um, I'm, I'm still handed over to Hazel. Uh, thanks very much for uh, for attending this uh, very interesting session, and thanks to Jingwa and Alex for their very insightful presentations. I really appreciate your um, your in, in, yeah insightful um, discussion. Also, thank you very much, uh, Hazel. Thank you so much. Um, nothing to add. If, if you're not a member of the IRPIC Collaborations community or the either sea ice or, and or modelers uh, community of practice, please do join those and you'll get um, email announcements about the meetings that were posted in the chat uh, so you can stay up to date on all of those really interesting upcoming activities. So uh, appreciate you all being here today and thank you again for the wonderful presentations and discussion. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Great. Thank all you right. all. Thanks.